turn it side. I'll never be able to see that. It's a oh, small gosh. print. Yeah, if you want us to, if you want to refer to <laughs> we'll that, you may have to, to face it toward you so you can read it to us because we can't see it. Okay. At least most of us can't. Some of us may be able to, but I think most of us can't. Okay. Bring it a little closer or something. Why don't you just read it to us? Because he, he would have to put that so yes, close, John. You put it by him. <laughs> Either bring it closer. He needs to put it close to where he can read, read it out loud, <laughs> anything he wants to point out, because we certainly aren't going to be able to see that. Okay, that works. Okay. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Rayleigh Alford. Uh, along with my colleague, Rick Stanley, I represent Clico Corporation and Clico Power, LLC. Um, we would like to reserve uh, 12 minutes for rebuttal, and I'll be sharing the time uh, with Ms. Amanda Smith of the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to present our argument to the court this afternoon, and we think that the best place to start uh, is with the very first paragraph of the plaintiff's petition, which is what we have here. In that first paragraph, the plaintiff state that this lawsuit focuses on Clico's systematic overcharging of Opelousas ratepayers for utility costs. That's what they came out and said in their very first paragraph of their petition. And under the plaintiff's own characterization of their claims, the question for this court is whether the LPSC or a district court has original jurisdiction over those claims. Clico's position, as the court knows from the briefing, is that the LPSC has original and exclusive jurisdiction over the plaintiff's challenges to Clico's rates. That position is grounded in the Louisiana Constitution and in the uh, and in decades of precedent from this court, most notably the court's decision in the Daily Advertiser case. Uh, we submit that there are four undisputed jurisdictional facts that support Clico's position and require the dismissal of this lawsuit. I don't know if that's any easier to read or not. The first fact, Your Honors, is that the plaintiffs are retail customers of Clico. Clico is their power company. Uh, the second fact is that the Louisiana Public Service Commission has exclusive jurisdiction over the rates that Clico charges to its retail customers. Uh, the third fact, Your Honors, is that the plaintiffs have been charged Clico's LPSC-approved rates. No more, no less. There is no dispute here about the rates that the plaintiffs were actually charged. Everyone concedes that the plaintiffs were charged exactly what the LPSC ordered Clico to charge. Uh, and the fourth fact is that the plaintiff's lawsuit seeks reparations for alleged rate overcharges. They contend that Clico should have charged them rates lower than the ones that the LPSC actually approved. Now, let, let me ask this, because apparently the relationship with the uh, folk in Opelousas may be a little bit different than your other customers. Uh, they, they are suggesting that we, our situations different from other retail customers because the contract is between Clico and the city of Opelousas 
we the third party beneficiaries of that contract. And I think I, uh, they're suggesting that uh, under the terms of the contract, you were supposed to have insurance for these uh, hurricane losses and that they shouldn't be passed through to retail customers. Okay. Isn't that their position? That is absolutely their position. Uh, with respect to the, the franchise agreement, Your Honor, uh, you mentioned stipulation for a tree. Right. Now, this court in a whole series of cases, uh, the Joseph case more recently, uh, Eagle Pipe, going back to 1905 in the Allen and Curry case, uh, this court has made clear that uh, municipal, that citizens of, muni of municipality are not automatically third-party beneficiaries uh, of a contract between their city uh, and a service provider. Uh, this court has gone one step further, and it has said that for that to happen, the intention to confer a benefit has to be manifestly clear. Now, in this particular franchise agreement, which, which uh, you all have reviewed, there is no express stipulation for the benefit of the plaintiffs. Neither the Third Circuit nor the plaintiffs have called this court or any court to a single specific provision uh, where that intention was made manifestly clear. Uh, and as you know from our brief, the consequences of that finding would be significant because if there is a third party beneficiary relationship, a contract cannot be modified without the consent of all of the third party beneficiaries. Local governments could not function if that were the law because they would have to go get the consent of every citizen before they could ever make any sort of adjustment or enter into any sort of a, of a contract. And with respect to the arguments in the franchise agreement itself, uh, Justice Johnson, the, the argument that has been set forward uh, is not consistent with, with the franchise agreement itself. The, the contention that the franchise agreement is inconsistent uh, with the LPSC approved rates uh, is absolutely contradicted by the text of the franchise agreement itself. On page three, the franchise agreement says, and I quote, it is understood and agreed that all consumers receiving electric service from Clico shall be served under Clico's present or modified applicable rates and policies as approved by the Louisiana Public Service Commission. That is exactly what Clico has done. Uh, there is no provision of the franchise agreement that says that Clico will seek a lower Opelousas only rate. Again, neither the plaintiffs nor the Third Circuit have cited this court to a single provision of the franchise agreement that says CLECO will do that. Uh, they also cite no provision for their position that CLECO agreed in the franchise agreement to only collect its distribution costs from the city of Opelousas at the end of the franchise term and not from the customers in Opelousas. Uh, the franchise agreement itself, Your Honor, never uses or defines the term distribution costs. It's nowhere in that agreement. Uh, now, in terms of uh, the argument that there is something unique about Opelousas, uh, the franchise agreement does address some relatively simple property issues that are strictly between the city of Opelousas and Clico. For example, if a, if a pole breaks in Opelousas today, Clico will go replace that pole and it will pay for it. Now, if some years down the road that franchise agreement terminates, Clico doesn't need that pole anymore. But the subsequent franchisee will need that pole in order to provide service in Opelousas. And so what the franchise agreement says is that the city of Opelousas will buy that pole at its depreciated value and then sell it to its new franchisee. That is it, Your Honor. That is, that is the supposedly unique uh, provision in this franchise agreement, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the rates. Uh, today, Clico may not replace a single pole in the city of Opelousas. Uh, but what Clico is doing today is providing electric service to the plaintiffs in Opelousas. And there are costs of providing that service. And what the franchise agreement says is that Clico will charge for that service the rates that the LPSC has set and approved. So there is nothing unique about this relationship that has anything to do with the rates and certainly nothing that removes it from the exclusive jurisdiction uh, of the Louisiana Public Service Commission. Now, you also mentioned Justice Johnson insurance coverage. Uh, we, we've briefed the issue. Uh, we've explained to you why there is no breach. We've explained why 
you know, this franchise agreement was entered into in 1991. A year later, Louisiana was struck by Hurricane Andrew. Uh, the insurance industry changed after that. Uh, today, uh, insurance companies do not insure poles and wires. Uh, but Op the Opelousas distribution system has not been treated differently from any other property owned by Clico. Uh, but the more fundamental point on the insurance question is that the LPSC has addressed that through storm surcharges. Um, and the plaintiffs, they are not the city of Opelousas. Uh, whatever obligation Clico owes to the city of Opelousas, uh, that is not enforceable uh, by the plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Again, back to the first paragraph of their petition, they're complaining about the rates, and that has nothing to do with the contractual relationship uh, between Clico and the city of Opelousas. Who can they complain to? Who can they complain to? The city? Public no, Your Honor, they can complain to the Louisiana Public Service Commission. In fact, that's what has actually happened. All of the arguments that the plaintiffs have, have made in court and that they will present to you today those have already been presented to the Louisiana Public Service Commission, and they have been rejected because the Louisiana Public Service Commission has determined that our rates are of general application. They apply to all of Clico's customers, and these particular plaintiffs have not been overcharged. So that determination has already been made. And, Justice Johnson, the LPSC, of course they reviewed the franchise agreement in the course of that. They just determined that it was irrelevant because – and it goes back to a, a holding by this court in the South Central Bell versus LPSC case in 1992. This court said, a commission-made rate furnishes the applicable law for the utility and its customers until a change is made by the commission. Now, in this lawsuit, the plaintiffs are asking a St. Landry District Court, instead of the commission, to set aside the applicable law between Clico and its customers, to set a new rate and to award retroactive refunds. Under Daily Advertiser, it is clear that the district court does not have jurisdiction to do what the plaintiffs are requesting. Uh, Daily Advertiser, like this case, was a putative class action. The claims alleged were, were virtually identical. Tort claims, contract claims, even a stipulation pour a tree theory was alleged in Daily Advertiser. Uh, this court held that the plaintiffs' tort and contract claims that sought recovery for rate overcharges could not proceed in the district court, and it dismissed those claims. The court wrote on page 17 of its opinion that the only jurisdiction that courts have over the fixing of utility rates is to review the LPSC orders on appeal. And even when exercising the appellate jurisdiction over a rate order, a court may not in the first instance fix or change rates to be charged by a public utility, but rather must remand to the LPSC for it to determine the appropriate rate to be charged customers. So, Your Honor, the, this court in 1993 answered the question and said you have to go to the LPSC in the first instance. That is the only body under our Constitution that can hear in the first instance your claim that you're being overcharged. Was the denial of the plaintiff's uh, assertions before the Public Service Commission appealed? Yes, Your Honor. It's currently on appeal to the 19th, the 19th. Judicial District, okay. which, again, is the constitutional framework uh, that is set forth. Um, in this case, the Third Circuit accepted the plaintiff's argument that this is not a rate matter. Uh, it reasoned as follows, and I quote, Since ratepayers raised tort and or contract claims against Clico, the exclusive jurisdiction of the LPSC is not invoked. That exact same argument was considered and expressly rejected in Daily Advertiser. Uh, this court in that case set forth a substance over form analysis. Uh, and it made clear that the courts are not bound by the tort or contract labels that a plaintiff may affix to his or her claims. Instead, the court looks to the essence of the plaintiff's claims. And when the central allegation is that a utility has charged too much for the service provided, the claim is for reparation of overcharges, and it falls within the exclusive and original jurisdiction of the LPSC. The court in Daily Advertiser went on to list a host of Louisiana cases where the courts had rejected what it called semantic endeavors to bring overcharge claims in a district court in circumvention of the LPSC's jurisdiction. Again, you won't see any mention of those cases in the Third Circuit's opinion. And under, again, the first paragraph of the plaintiff's petition here, in which they actually use the word overcharging, there is certainly no basis for concluding 
that this is not a rate matter within the LPSC's exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, the Third Circuit also found in its opinion that, and I quote, contract interpretation and the assessment of CLECO's conduct are judicial functions. Again, Daily Advertiser, it considered the judicial function argument and it expressly rejected it. This court held in no uncertain terms that rate matters are constitutionally subtracted from the original jurisdiction of the district courts. This court also held that interpreting or determining the reasonableness of a rate authorized by the LPSC is an administrative function and not a judicial function. This court further noted that the LPSC has full power to determine if overcharges were made, to fashion appropriate remedies, and to utilize comparable procedural and discovery devices to those that are utilized by the courts. This court even said that the LPSC has an adjudicative sphere that is similar to that of a district court. What the court does, is it, it looks to the Constitution and it determines whether the case is a rate matter. And if it's a rate matter, the original exclusive jurisdiction lies with the LPSC. There was also an argument, uh, not accepted by the Third Circuit, but, uh, but advanced in the district court and advanced again before this court, uh, that this case falls outside of the LPSC's plenary power over Clico because the city of Opelousas owns some distribution assets. Uh, the Constitution does not support that argument. The focus of the Constitution, particularly Article 4, Section 21B, uh, it says that the LPSC shall regulate public utilities like CLECO. Now, the very next section, Section 21C, has an exception to the LPSC's exclusive jurisdiction that applies only to a public utility that is owned, operated, or regulated by a municipality. CLECO is not owned, operated, or regulated by a municipality. And again, it, the plaintiffs are customers of CLECO, and they are challenging CLECO's rates. Accordingly, there is no possible way that this case could come within the exception to the LPSC's plenary power under 21C because, quite simply, it is CLECO's rates that are at issue. The plaintiffs in their briefing have made light of the public policy points that CLECO has raised before this court. Um, I believe that Hurricane Isaac has just given us all a very powerful reminder of how vital electric service is to Louisiana, to its citizens, and to its economy. Uh, in this case, a district court in St. Landry Parish is asserting jurisdiction to <laughs> retroactively set aside orders of the LPSC that determine how CLECO would recover the cost of restoring power after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita in 2005. Clico's restoration costs from those two storms were around $165 million. Uh, that is significantly greater than Clico's annual cash receipts, uh, at the time anyway. Uh, and the LPSC during that period was faced with the very real problem of how to maintain the financial integrity of a utility that, that provides service to, to 279,000 customers in Louisiana in a fair and reasonable manner. And it determined in the exercise of its constitutional responsibilities that all of Clico's customers, including the plaintiffs, would have to bear some of the costs of restoring the system, uh, of getting our economy uh, moving again after those storms. That was the LPSC's determination. Now, in this lawsuit, now the, the plaintiffs did not appeal those rulings uh, as they had a right to do under Title 45, Section 1192, or the Louisiana Constitution. Uh, instead, they go to district court in St. Landry Parish many years after those storms. For this court to allow parish by parish collateral attacks on LPSC orders that, uh, that address things as, as vital as storm recovery uh, outside of the constitutional framework would result in tremendous uncertainty about mm. utility rates. And it would also mark a severe departure from this court's settled precedent in this area. I've already touched on some of the venue points that we briefed, and so I'll, I'll rest in the briefing, and I will, uh, unless there are any questions, reserve uh, the time for rebuttal. Thank you.
sort of submission. I know, but John's got to take that from his rebuttal. John, you can take her time off of his rebuttal time. Will be minus the time that she yes. takes. Yes. Okay. Correct. I thought I'd steal about four minutes of his rebuttal time. Um, good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, Amanda Smith for the Public Service Commission. Uh, may it please the court. The basic concepts of rate making are really at the heart of this case. Every utility customer in the state is unique. Uh, customers live in small towns, big cities. Some of these cities have had their own electrical systems in the past that they've owned and operated. Um, the commission cited the uh, Clico City of Franklin case in which that was an issue there. The city had formerly owned and operated their own system. And what wound up happening in that case was it was an example of something that was purely a contractual, contractual dispute. There was a franchise agreement there and at some point the City of Franklin had annexed more area to the city. And when they did so, they sought a different franchise agreement with a different utility and Clico filed suit in that case and there was some discussion in that case of, as to whether since something involved a dispute between basically two utilities would the commission have jurisdiction and there it was found that that is purely a, you know an issue of a contractual nature who you know what utility would be allowed to serve in case there was more area annexed onto a town very distinguishable to the case here where you as Mr. Alford pointed out from the onset of the case it's been a dispute about money and rates and how much the customers were charged. Um, utility regulation seeks to make rates that are fair for all customers and the utility involved. The uh, filed rate doctrine is a basic tenet of rate making as well and it states that a utility may not charge any rate other than that, that has been investigated and approved by the govern governing body, in this case, the commission. So Coleco actually could not charge the customers of Opelousas anything other than what is on file with the Public Service Commission. Uh, again, as Mr. Alford pointed out, there's no dispute here that the Opelousas customers were charged according to a Public Service Commission rate. There's been no um, allegations that they were overcharged based on those rates. Uh, for the case to proceed now at the 27th JDC would just be uh, a judicial inefficiency. We cited the Hurlitz case that uh, any activity that would occur in district court at this point would be moot as the LPSC has jurisdiction. Um, in the declaratory judgment brought before the commission by Coleco during the pendency of this action, the uh, com commission administrative law judge examined the facts at issue here and she found I exactly what we've discussed today. At its root, it's really just a, it, it, it's a rate dispute. Uh, the commission agreed with her and voted and that order was uh, signed in 2011. Uh, the commission also cited the LPNL case which was an extremely confusing procedurally case and I, I used it mostly just to demonstrate exactly what can happen when a case is you know passed back and forth between courts and jurisdictions you know debated all the while the utility continues to charge for utility uh, you know services so at the point that it finally arrived at this court it, it was such you know, a procedural mess that this court had to do some pretty severe remedial action to make the utility whole and yet, you know, arrive at a fair result for the customers. The delays and improper procedures there just show what happens when a case is allowed to proceed too long in an improper forum. Uh, the city of Opelousas clearly falls within the commission jurisdiction. Again, Mr. Alford addressed um, constitutional Article Article 4, Section 21C, only utilities that are clearly, clearly owned and operated by a political subdivision uh, lie with outside the Commission's jurisdiction. And I, we cited the Liberty Rice Mill case there just as a, you know, a, a demonstration of what it, a real municipally owned
utility looks like and how they operate. In those cases, such as the city of New Orleans, you know, it's the, it's the city council or other governing body that determines the rates and makes their procedures and not the Public Service Commission. So um, that's all I have unless you have any questions for me. Thank you, Your Honors. Chief Justice Kimball, and may it please the court, J.R. Whaley, along with Mr. Uh, Robert Beck and um, Pride Duran and Anna Simmons and Jeff Bassett, who represent the interest of the Opelousas ratepayers. The question before the court is jurisdictional, and I would respectfully suggest that a good part of the first part of the Clico Council's argument dealt more with the merits of the case rather than the jurisdictional issues. And the jurisdictional issues should boil down to two questions, essentially. Do terms of a contract, even one with a public utility, matter? Excuse me. Uh, does the Appaloosas even meet the definition of a public utility? They don't serve customers, do they? They, they do, Your Honor, through a franchise agreement. And that, I think, goes to the heart of the Is question. Is that what the statute means? I, I would say that the Constitution, Your Honor, Article 21, Section, um, um, Article 4, Section 21C, specifically deals with this situation. And before we get to rate making and before we get to the question of a public utility, we specifically have to answer and look at Article 4, Section 21C. And what that, what that, article, what that uh, constitutional provision states is that the Commission shall have no power to regulate a common carrier that was owned, operated, or regulated, and this is the important phrase, on the effective date of this Constitution by the governing authority of one or more political subdivisions. So we have to look what the situation was, not today, but in 1974. And all of the evidence that we have, and of course we're just at the subject matter jurisdiction standpoint, but based on the information that we know is that in 1974, the city of Opelousas operated its own utility. And what's important about that, Your Honor, is that's, that's the threshold constitutional question that this court has to get over first. Now, the other issue about that, Your Honor, about whether or not it's a public utility, I'm not questioning whether or not CLECO fits that definition. But in this situation, what we, what, we, what we know is, is that the city of Opelousas maintained ownership of its distribution system. We know at one time the city of Opelousas generated and sold its own power. And we know that through the course of, of history in the 80s, there was evidently some determination by the city, uh, city leaders that they were going to grant a franchise. And that's important, Your Honor, because in the Slimco case um, that we cited in our brief, there's a specific discussion about the city of Opelousas and that specific referendum that occurred. And what's important about that is that that shows us, looking backwards, that there was no question that it was a public utility, and, here, and here's why, a public utility that would satisfy the definition and would satisfy the definition under Article 4, Section 21C. And that is because of the fact, Your Honors, that the, 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 the Slimco case specifically discusses the election. And what that case says, Your Honor, is that the election was held pursuant to Louisiana Revised Statute 33 colon 4341. And in the first paragraph of the Slimco case says that this was an election pursuant to 4341. And the whole case dealt with interpretation of 4341. That's important because then we can go and look, well, well what's 4341 have to, have to deal with? And specifically, 
4341 has to deal, it's, it's, it's in Title 33 under municipalities and parishes, Chapter 10, public utilities, uh, Part 3, disposition of utility property and granting of franchises, and then Subpart A and the title is sale or lease of revenue producing public utility. So that's a long way to get to an answer that yes, Your Honor, I believe that, that we are talking about a public utility because of what Slimco says, because of what the facts are, and in particular what uh, 33, um, 33 colon 4341. And so that allows us to recognize the fact of two important things. One I just spoke on, uh, Chief Justice Kimball, is the fact that this was a public utility. But the second one, in regard to the stipulation poor our tree argument, which I would respectfully submit is more of a no right, no cause of action argument, rather than a summary <laughs> judgment, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, subject matter jurisdiction issue. I think that, and I, I, I hate to uh, curse myself, but, but if the, the district court were to, I, I don't believe that that issue was raised in the district court under a no right, no cause of action. We very well may be interpreting the terms of this contract incorrectly. And if this court decides that a district court has jurisdiction to interpret the terms of those contracts, then I believe that a district court could say, nice try, fellows, but y'all don't, in, y'all, y'all don't fit into the definition of a stipulation poor our tree. And that's not really what's in front of the court today. What's in front of the court today is a summary judgment issue. But if we go there, I believe that... I'm sorry? It's not summary judgment. It's exception to I'm, jurisdiction, isn't it? I'm sorry. Subject matter jurisdiction. All of my notes say MSJ, and I'm used to uh, uh, <laughs> motion for summary judgment. Um, so the election was held pursuant to that statute, which says that a public utility can lease its own facilities. That's exactly what happened here. But then also important for purposes of the stipulation for our tree is that that case, Slimco, shows that the rate payers in Opelousas were the objects of the franchise agreement, and the franchise agreement could not even come into existence without the rate payers and the voters in Opelousas approving it, because Slimco specifically lays out what the ballot is. One of them is Clico, which is the franchise agreement we're fighting about today, and the other one is Slimco. So that, that we believe, Your Honors, is, the, is kind of the first step um, in the process. And, and to also you know, look at this, it's helpful to, to us, at least, to, to put it in, into real terms and what the contract says. And we believe, Your Honor, that, that the context that is easiest to discuss is the issue of the insurance clause. And for purposes of the record in the, in the exhibit folder from the Third Circuit, the, the specific insurance clause can be found on um, record 22, as well as some, some issues that we'll discuss at record 16 and 17. But there's no question when you look at that insurance, or I'm sorry, when you look at that franchise agreement, there's really no question that Clico contractually obligated itself in bargain for negotiated and approved terms said we're going to buy you insurance for your distribution system and that makes sense because the city of Opelousa said this is our this is our distribution system and we're going to keep it and the and the and the franchise agreement specifically says ownership doesn't change hands so Clico in our case is a contract based case and so it's I think important to remember that these are terms of a contract, bargained for, negotiated over, and agreed to. And in that, Clico contractually agreed to purchase insurance. There's also agreed on record 1617 of the Third Circuit folder that the damages that, again, Clico bargained for, negotiated, contractually agreed to, terms that said, look, Damages to the distribution system caused by natural destruction or acts of God, we're going we're gonna, to, the city of Opelousas is going to pay those, not the ratepayers, And the city of Opelousas is going to pay those at the conclusion of the, of the franchise term. This is a historical question. Yes. You suggest that in 1974, 
the city of Opelousas operated its own utility? That's that that and 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 uh, Justice Johnson, that's not in the record, um, but that is our understanding. And particularly when you read Slimco case, at, ba based on I guess out of out of the record information, that's that's our belief. Um, but based on the Slimco case, that certainly seems indicative of uh, of the issue too, because the Slimco and Clico franchise agreements were in competition for each other in 1988 and the franchise agreement was signed in 91 and there was a previous agreement with Slimco in 81. So our best information right now, again not in the record, is that. If, if the exclusion is based upon your contention that they operated their own in that time, why is it not in the record? Doesn't it need to be in the record for us to deal with? Well, we don't normally just deal with things that are not in the record. <laughs> well, well, that, that's that's fair enough, Your Your Honor, and it is not in the record. I believe that someone who is contesting subject matter jurisdiction may have the burden to prove lack of subject matter matter jurisdiction. I believe that in our initial pleading, we are we allege uh, subject matter jurisdiction in the in the trial court, and so. Um, I don't know is the answer uh, in, in regard to the legal question about who bears the burden, but I would suspect that with with our class action petition, you know, we, we made the, the jurisdiction and venue allegations. And so I think that, that that meets our burden, and then if Clico wants to... At to the exception hearing to discuss subject matter jurisdiction, there was no evidence put on, it was only argument. Um, we we talked about the Slimco case and what the Slimco case meant in regard to uh, uh, 33 colon 4341 and and so I you know Your Honor I don't think I think that all of the there was evidence no testimony or exhibits introduced it was no. only argument of counsel no no Your Honor um, and and I don't believe that based on the clear wording of the statute relied upon in the Slimco case that 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 there's any debate about that. Um, because there's there's clearly what was discussed in the Slimco case uh, is is exactly what the title says: sale or lease of revenue producing utility property, and that a municipality can take what it owns and uh, lease it. And so um, there's no question that the distribution system is owned. In the record, Your Honor. There's, I believe, uh, 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 mention in the franchise agreement about the continued ownership of the generation, uh, of the generation system and things of that nature. Uh, and there's, there's clearly no question that the distribution system. Can you tell me that the, that the franchise agreement was introduced at the hearing? Oh, uh, the, the, the <laughs> franchise agreement is all over this record. Okay. Um, but, 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 you know, Your Honor, it's a, it's a fair point. So let's let's assume that that's all we got, and let's assume that all we have in the record is that the distribution system is owned by Clico. I would then draw your honor's attention to the Clico versus LPSC case that we that we've cited in our brief, and the Clico versus LPSC case. If you read the factual background, I believe that you'll be very satisfied that it's very similarly similar factually to our situation here. In that case, the city of Franklin owned and operated an electric power system, just like Opelousas. The city of Franklin called a referendum election, just like Opelousas. They entered into an agreement with but we don't Clico. know that Opelousas did that, do we, in this record? Oh, we, we Other absolutely. Other than you telling us that? I mean, is there anything in here to suggest that? Suggest that there was a referendum election? Yes. The, the Slimco case specifically, it's, it's, a, it's a public record, the Slimco case specifically discusses the, the election and there's, there's absolutely no challenge that the Slimco case deals with the, this, this election and this franchise agreement. Um, Some type of uh, judicial notice based on what's in an, an opinion in a different case? I believe so, Your Honor. I mean, there's there's no there's no question that the um, that that the Slimco case discusses this election. The, not the ordinary and customary use of judicial notice, is it? 
Well, the, the, uh, the appendix in the, um, in the case, Your Honor, the, the, the appendix is part of the case. And so I believe that if the facts were, you know, discussed in that case and there's been no challenge to that and the appendix is part of the case, um, you know, I, I, I believe that that would be appropriate for Your Honors to note. But like here, Clico agreed to operate the city's electrical distribution system. The distribution system, Chief Justice Kimball. And so they made other promises very similar to those made in Opelousas under the franchise agreement. Clico, during the course of that, felt like the city of Franklin violated the terms of the franchise agreement. And there are few important procedural issues that are worth noting. In that case, the, the Louisiana Supreme Court noted that the LPSC relied on Article 4, Section 21C, and, quote, adhered to its previously announced position of refusing to construe agreements between municipalities and public utilities or to resolve disputes arising under such agreements. Also, the Louisiana Supreme Court in that case made a number of, 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 of findings. And in that case, the, 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 the Clico versus LPSC court said that the issues of the validity and enforcement of contracts and the interpretation of statutes and municipal charters are generally civil matters over which the district courts have original jurisdiction. The Supreme Court also said the conflicting rights in the present case arose from franchises granted by the city of Franklin. Also said that this case does not involve the PCS rate making power. So all of those notes and the actual holding of the Clico versus LPSC case says that look, this was a franchise agreement. All of the fight in that arises under the terms of the franchise agreement. And district courts every day decide and determine the rights and responsibilities that flow from that. Well, you know, I, this is what I'm struggling with. Okay. The, 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 uh, under the constitutional provision, the uh, Public Service Commission would not regulate a public utility owned by a municipality. Uh, and right now we're saying that the city of Opelousas only owns a distribution system. So what, how is that different from the public utility? Can we call a distribution system a public utility? I, I, I think you can, Your Honor, and I think that's what Clico versus LPS. How are they different, L L is what I'm asking. Well, the, the distribution system is typically thought of as the, 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 the poles and the lines and things of that nature to distribute the electricity to the rate payers. But Whereas there, the there, utility is no, there is no utility company that produces power here. So there is no, no public utility. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I believe um, that Clico probably generates the power and or buys the power from another generator to run on their lines and to sell. Well, I guess I, I'm just trying to see how we could, how we could fit this distribution system within the well, definition of public utility. I, I, because I think, Your Honor, because of Clico versus LPSC case, because in that case, the, all we were talking about was the distribution system. Okay. And, and I believe that there is enough in the record. Poles and that, wires. If, 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 if you reread the, the Clico versus LPSC case and pay particular attention about what they were talking about, all they were talking about was a distribution system. That's all that we have in our situation. And in that case, I'd respectfully suggest that the, that the Louisiana Supreme Court in that situation said that um, this is a municipal um, a, a franchise agreement and district courts raise, uh, district courts uh, interpret terms of contracts all day long. I don't believe, Your Honor, that the holding of Clico versus LPSC necessarily dealt with the distribution system. But the reason that it's important in regard to the distribution system is that the LPSC in that situation 
looked at the facts of the case and said that it adhered to its previously announced position of refusing to construe agreements between municipalities and public utilities or to resolve disputes arising under such agreements. And so the utility, um, you know, in, in that situation was only the, the distribution system. The exception has to do with the rate making authority, doesn't it? It, 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 and it if does. there's no rate making issue, which you suggested in the earlier case, then it doesn't really matter. But in this case, uh, isn't it going to be necessary in uh, this case for you to show that that is an op that Opelousas is a public utility to get it out from under the Public Service Commission? I, th I think the answer to your question is no. Um, although it may rate making may be implicated. And the reason that I believe that the answer to your question is no is that there are three hurdles that CLECO has to jump before the LPSC can be found to have jurisdiction. The first hurdle is to show that Article 4, Section 21C is not applicable. Um, the second constitution, that's the, the whole discussion that we've had about the, about the, about uh, Slimco and, and, and public, util uh, public utility owned by a municipality. The second constitutional issue that I think that the uh, that, that CLECO has to, to get over is Article 1, Section 23, which is discussed in the Conoco case that was cited by CLECO. And Article uh, 1, Section 23 talks about impairment of contracts. And what the Conoco case says, because the way I interpret CLECO's argument is, is that, look, we made an agreement. We may have made a deal. We don't think we breached it. But even if we did breach it, it's no big deal because the LPSC, they're the, they're the experts, and they can tell us what, uh, uh, what we can do and what we can't do. I think the problem with that is Article 1, Section 23 of the Louisiana Constitution, which specifically says that rule, laws can't abrogate contracts. And in, in Clico's brief, they cite Conoco, and I believe either they or the LPSC cite Gulf States versus LPSC. And the Conoco case at 407 says this, the constitutional restrictions against impairment of obligations requires that contracts not be abrogated without careful consideration of all the circumstances and a clear showing that the public interest requires it. The rate making power should yield to valid contracts whenever that is possible and consistent with the public good. I believe, your, your honors, that that showing certainly hasn't been made. And I don't believe it's been made for just a, a, a simple fact is that the LPSC never considered this franchise agreement. The LPSC was never given the opportunity to look at this franchise agreement and say, wait a minute, Clico, you agreed to buy Opelousas insurance. And then you're coming to us and asking us for a surcharge for insurance? There's, there's absolutely no question that before the LPSC proceeding instituted Chief Justice Kimball by Clico, uh, and we can talk about that if y'all would like, but I just want to make sure that, that, that that's clear, that the LPSC never considered the terms of this franchise agreement. So if we look at Clico versus LPSC case, and we look at just first year law obligations, the, 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 you know, contracts matter. And the terms of a contract matter. And before you go and say, hey, look, this contract is either not a good deal for us anymore, this contract is not a good deal for ratepayers as a whole, the, this contract is not a good deal for uh, the, the whole system, the policy argument that, that Mr. Raley made at the conclusion of his. Okay, I mean, you get to make that argument, but that argument was never made. And so all of the cases, and it was never made because the LPSC never had the opportunity to look at the terms of this contract before this lawsuit was filed. And so I believe, Your Honors, looking at all of the cases, you know, if you kind of uh, read all of the cases about the filed rate doctrine and, and, and uh, even the, the primary jurisdiction cases under daily advertiser, and I would like to talk about daily advertiser before my time is up, it all seems, Your Honor, that, that what the courts look at is they say, what in, in, the, in, the, in the CLECO versus LPSC court says this, you know, 
what are the what are the plaintiffs or what are the ratepayers or what are the parties what's the relief demanded and what kind of expertise is required of that <clears throat> y'all y'all are all judges and y'all are not experts in in electric rate making neither am i but we're all lawyers and we can read a contract and say well clico said that they were going to do this and the facts are that and is there a breach of those contractual agreements so what we are the relief that we're demanding is not to go back in and refigure and and recalculate uh, anything that the LPSC has done what we the relief that we're demanding the relief that we request is for a judicial determination of the rights and responsibilities and obligations that flow from agreed to contractual bargained for terms and that's what it is almost exclusively uh, Clico has relied on daily advertiser and so um, in, in my short little bit of time if I could uh, with the court's indulgence obviously I want to answer any questions and address any concerns but just just in regard to the daily advertiser case that was a very fact specific case it was very specific to fuel adjustment charges the way cog the weighted average cost of gas and the PGA, PGA which is um, a, another gas clause I can't remember what it stands for an investigation had already been conducted by the LPSC and throughout that decision if you if you read that decision again there's a lot of focus and a lot of determination of what the LPSC had already done in regard to the specific rate at issue and what what, what we did and uh, my, my opposing counsel has seen this a couple of times now um, is you know on pages and and um, on pages uh, 12 13 and 14 of the decision there are a number of things that the Louisiana Supreme Court specifically noted that the that the LPSC did in regard to the WACOG and in regard to the PGA and this is just a, a simple-minded idea uh, in, out, of, out of my mind to say you know these are all the things that were important to the daily advertiser case about what the LPSC did in regard to the rated issue and then this is what the LPSC did in regard to the rate at, at, at issue in our case um, there was some discussion which um, I, I want to address about the LPSC proceeding and the LPSC proceeding was instituted by Clico after this lawsuit was filed and um, uh, neither Mr. Um, Alford or um, uh, his firm was involved in that proceeding and a different staff attorney from the um, from the LPSC was involved in the proceeding in front of the LPSC um, and, and I think that there's a little bit of disconnect of what we think happened and what uh, Clico thinks happened but it doesn't really matter what I think or what Mr. Beck thinks or Mr. Bassett or any or any anybody else thinks let, let me ask one quick yes, question sir. procedurally were you able to intervene in that we, proceeding to derail it if you will for lack of a better term or urge no tried. no we subject tried. matter jurisdiction we, we tried justice Weimer um, we did intervene we uh, asked for discovery uh, we were we were provided a, a very minimal amount of, of, of right to conduct discovery um, in that case and and I think even what's in the record uh, in regard to <laughs> Commission's order is that Clico argued in the LPSC that this is a very narrow issue we're just very narrow and Beck and Bassett and Whaley and Duran and all y'all want to come in and expand this this is a very very narrow issue and the and the narrow issue was just two questions you know were were, were the people in Opelousas charged the LPSC approved rates we say yes they didn't have to file a, a motion with the LPSC yes that's the problem and then were the were they overcharged in regard to those rates well the th the third question Justice Weimer that we were never able to get to we were never able to ask is is that okay is it okay that they were charged 
the same, the same rates that people in Baton Rouge or Alexandria were charged. That's the meat of the question. And we weren't able to get the answer to that question. And that's not me saying that. If you look on page 7 of Exhibit uh, 5 of the writ application, the commission itself says that how and why the commission determined what aspect of CLECO's rates and policies are irrelevant, as are irrelevant CLECO's obligations and actions. Finally, what's irrelevant is 45 colon 1176, which mandates the commission shall look at contracts that the utilities enter into. They said that was irrelevant too. So I'd respectfully suggest that the fulsome overview that uh, uh, my opponents believe occurred at the LPSC didn't occur. In, in conclusion, Your Honors. Am I to assume, or may we assume, that as traditionally is, there's virtually little or no record at Public Service Commission of what happened? Yeah, that, they usually do that. That's right. Okay. Um, to find jurisdiction in the LPSC, um, we believe you have to find two things, is that Article 4, Section 21C is inapplicable, that, 20, that Article 21, Section 23 is inapplicable, and that this is a rape case implicating the specialized expertise of the LPSC. Um, in regard to that question, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm over. I, 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 I wasn't reading it correctly. I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, okay. I, w I, was, I was hoping that the clerk was giving me more time because I was making such great progress. But no. I, I apologize <laughs> for going over. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Right. Next matter on the docket. Oh, God, dog it. What is the matter with me and rebuttal? I've done that over and over again. I'm sorry. I did not mean to deny you your rebuttal. I have a habit of doing that this week for some reason. I did it last time. I don't know what's going on. Friday afternoon, me. I understand. I'd like to blame it on that, but I'm afraid it's probably bigger than that. <laughs> your Honor, it's one of the, the first points. Uh, that uh, Mr. Whaley made concerned uh, what was the situation in 1974? Your Honors, the situation in 1974 is completely irrelevant to this case. Mr. Whaley's right. The issue before this court is jurisdictional. I, I think that he was speaking in terms of a question that I asked, which is whether or not Opelousas was operating a public utility. And he indicated that the Constitution said I think that's what he said, but that if it was operating as a public utility in 1974, it's thereafter considered a public utility. Do you disagree with that? I absolutely do. Okay. The, the point of the, of the constitutional provision, uh, 21B says that the commission shall regulate all common carriers and public utilities. Right. Now, there's no dispute, and back to our list of the material jurisdictional facts, there's no dispute that the Louisiana Public Service Commission has regulatory authority over CLECO. There's no... no we're not that. talking about that. We're talking about... There, there's no question. So, so under, 20, under 21B, that's where we are. The LPSC is the regulatory body uh, with jurisdiction over CLECO. 21C is an exception. It's entitled limitation. It says the commission shall have no power to regulate any public utility owned, operated, or regulated on the effective day of this Constitution. Now... There is, the LPSC is not trying to regulate any utility that was owned, operated, or regulated in 1974 by the governing authority of a municipality. The, the, the issue here uh, is CLECO's rates. That's what they're, they have not sued the city of Opelousas. There's no, con, there's no. Can, can you answer the question uh, it, whether the city of Opelousas ever owned a public ever could be classified as a public utility, whether they ever owned or operated a uh, 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 power plant or something? I can't answer it definitively, well, but I, I agree. Can, can you I, answer the question whether, whether they still have a distribution system? Yeah, they do. 
there is a distribution system in the in the city of Opelousas. Some and of the that, assets are owned by the city of Opelousas. That, that would be the poles and the wires. Poles and the wires. However, any pole and wire installed since 1981 is currently owned by Clico. Okay. So it's been a long time since the city of Opelousas uh, has has operated uh, a a utility. Uh, it doesn't function as a utility. We gave you the example of the city of Kaplan, uh, and the city of Kaplan is an example. Uh, they submit bills to their customers. They have a utility that uh, secures power and does all the things that a utility does. There's no contention here that the city of Opelousas does that. And the LPSC certainly hasn't come in and tried to assert authority over the city of Opelousas. So th there is no utility within the contemplation of 21C, and it doesn't really matter uh, when, uh, when the city of Opelousas would have been uh, a public utility because the fact is that it isn't one now. Now the question was raised, um, can a distribution system uh, be considered a public utility? Uh, the answer is not without rewriting the law. Uh, Title 45 section 121 says the term electric public utility means any person, person furnishing electric service within the state. It is undisputed here. There is no allegation and nothing in the record that indicates that the city of Opelousas furnishes electric service. It does not. Coleco provides electric service to the residents of Opelousas. The city of Opelousas does not. So a distribution system under the statutes and cases that are cited in our brief does not equal being a public utility. Uh, there was some discussion about, obviously there's been a lot of discussion about the franchise agreement. Uh, Ultimately, the franchise agreement is irrelevant to the jurisdictional determination. Uh, there is a long line of cases from this court. Mr. Whaley mentioned the Conoco case. That's one of them. Going all the way back to 1922 in the Shreveport versus Southwestern Gas. All of those cases from this court uh, over 90 years make the point that a utility can set a rate in a contract with a city or in the Conoco case with Conoco. Uh, but but if that utility is subject to regulation by the LPSC, the commission always has the authority to adjust that rate and order the utility to charge a different rate. Now, Mr. Whaley brought up the, the provision in the Constitution about uh, impairment of contractual obligations. This court absolutely considered that in Conoco. Uh, and that is absolutely a consideration whenever a whenever the commission would try to come in and say, we see the contractual rate, but we're going to order you to charge a different rate. But the question is, who has the authority to examine whether the appropriate rate is charged or whether a contract needs to yield to a different commission set rate? And the answer is exclusive jurisdiction lies with the LPSC. To see that that is the case, all this court need do is look at its opinion in Conoco. Because in Conoco, the court sent that question to the LPSC. So Mr. Whaley has asserted that the LPSC just did a poor job in, in, in looking at the franchise agreement or allegedly not looking at the franchise agreement. But the jurisdictional question is where does that dispute belong? And the answer is simple. The LPSC entered an order in December of last year that said these plaintiffs were not overcharged. Under the Constitution, their remedy is to appeal that to the 19th Judicial District, and ultimately there's a right of appeal to this court. There is no law that says you get to take that dispute over to the district court in St. Landry Parish. There's no authority for that. Um, with respect to uh, the Slimco case, that's not relevant uh, to the jurisdictional question. Uh, the, the question of an election that's required under the revised statute whenever a, whenever a city wants to lease utility assets. Is the happened. Public Service Commission order that you just referred to in this record? Yes, it is, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, and it's also, we provide in our brief the, the Westlaw citation to it. And it was, I believe it's exhibit, uh, appendix exhibit <coughs> five. And in that order, by the way, there was, there, was, there was some disparaging comments made, but the Public Service Commission, uh, its opinion is very well reasoned. It relies on the authorities of this court, uh, and their point quite simply was that the franchise agreement is not relevant because we determine Clico's rates and 
where the allegation is that you've been overcharged, you don't have a claim against Coleco because they charge the rates that we ordered them to charge. Uh, and the last point that I would make uh, is that you still, throughout the entire argument, have not been called, uh, your attention has not been called to a single provision of the franchise agreement that said that Coleco would charge a different rate than what it charged. So there really is no dispute here. Thank you. Thank you. Next matter on the docket this afternoon is NRA Judge Leo Booth 